Hi, I'm Mike. And I'm Dave. And join us every Thursday for a new episode of Two Player Bros, a podcast about two guys who play way too many video games. Join me and Dave as we talk about the latest in Xbox, PlayStation, PC, and VR news, previews, and reviews. We have it all, and we play it all. And join us every other week for Post Game, where we play through and dive deep into our favorite modern classics and new releases. That's Two Player Bros, available every Thursday wherever you get your podcast. part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Hi there, I'm Lloyd. And I'm John, and we're from Pina Comics. As we dive into your favorite pop culture topics, we may just... Occasionally... Use language that could be considered... Globaloney? What? No, I mean... Oh, foul? Exactly. Offensive? No doubt. Uh, crass? You bet your ass! Sophisticated? What? No, no! Uh, Anyways, you get it by now. It's mostly just... Gutter talk! And one more thing. Watch out for spoilers. Sometimes we drop them like trousers. You've been warned. Listen in. Welcome to the Pint Movie Invitational Series. Отец твой был сука и фраер, что на власти в Ябо. Так? Welcome back to your... I don't know. Sorry, I wasn't looking at you, Lloyd. Sorry. <laughs> I just de- I just deflated Lloyd's shot. Yeah. Go ahead. Go here ahead. Comes, here comes the weak part. Yeah. Oh, that oh. was garbage. There you go. That was Didn't garbage. <laughs> Lloyd, Lloyd was attempting to pop a beer at the time I was going to introduce the show and I wasn't looking yeah, at him. already came out. I wasn't looking at him like I normally do. Uh, yeah. you know, I've got, I've got three beefcakes on the show. I don't know yeah. what to do here. I'm looking all over the place. I'm, I'm like a little gay kid in a candy I shop mean. all of a sudden. <laughs> oh God. I'm in beef. I'm in uh, beef we'll castle city. Kirill. Yeah. Beef <laughs> castles. Yeah, really. <laughs> so uh, you heard Andrew Morgan, our, uh, compatriot over at the Nomcast. He introduces the Pint Movie Invitational episodes. And with me tonight, we have the Manster. Manster, what's right going on? Last day of my furlough. Love it. Love it that it's the last day? No, I loved having it. I just yeah. don't want to go back to work now. Well, mm. you got to. to it. You got I to. I never got the break, you know. All right. Well, with us as well, Mr. Arguing with Myself, Chris Frodel. Chris, what's going on? Nothing, nothing. Same old in the COVID. You don't have COVID, though. Let's make that clear. No, 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 I don't. Okay. I don't. Uh, All right. There, there was a point where I was challenging the COVID and saying, you know what? Just give it to me. Let's get this over with. Let's <laughs> yeah. move on. But I, I'm over that. I'm You're over, over that? that now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and our guest for this evening is a podcaster who uh, has been a friend of the show and is a personal friend. Well, he's a personal friend of all of us, but he's a personal, personal, personal friend of Chris from what, like high school? Is that what it is? Yeah. Yep. yep. All right. From another mother. Brother from another mother down in North Kakalaka. It is Shane Beauregard. Shane has a awesome podcast called Media Mosh. I, uh, a few months ago, I did an episode all by myself to make right around the beginning of COVID. I had to fill a week and I did it by myself. And I mentioned on that episode that Shane is at, he's like a personal hero because Shane does his show by himself. Usually it's, he's got his wife on sometimes he's had Chris and Chris's wife on at other times, but like 90% of the time it's Shane steering the ship, talking about the latest Netflix, Amazon, Hulu releases, movie releases. Remember those? Remember those <laughs> movies? <laughs> um, movies? And yeah, so Shane does this all by himself and I don't know how he does it. Shane, what's going on, man? Well, thanks for having me on here. I'm doing well. I would give my testicle and most of my fingers to get back to work right now. <laughs> oh, so you, that's right. You are, you are. if you don't mind me saying, you're a personal trainer, right? 
Yes. So gym's closed. You've been out for a while. Since mid-March. Just oh, me and wow. the kids. Me and the kids since mid-March. I and- am full blown. Tony Danza every day. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let me ask you a question. This is a really important question. If you were Tony Danza in Who's the Boss, he always had all of his attention on Angela. Would you have thrown it in Mona? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Before Angela. Before yeah. Angela. Yeah, Mona before Angela, hands down. And she wanted it so yeah. bad. She did. If Angela was in the room, you wouldn't know because no. Mona. Yeah, it's all about Mona. Mona. Right. Yeah, Catherine Hellman, who passed away yeah. last year, I think, in circa 1984, 85, looking pretty good and making no bones about it that she would have jumped all over. To- what was Tony's? Tony Danza always plays a Tony in a show. Yeah. What was his last name? Maselli? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. Yeah. Wow. Right. Good. My favorite thing about who's the boss as a kid, two things. Number one, I knew Alyssa Milano was going to be Omega level hot back then. Right. We all knew I was oh, a kid. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, number two, the way Tony said everybody's name, right? It was uh, Angela, Samantha, Jonathan. <laughs> all right. So enough about who's the boss. Shane, why don't you tell us real quick about Media Mosh and what you talk about and how you got into all this? Oh, man. Okay. You summed it up pretty nicely to begin with. But how I got into it is uh, at work, actually. Everyone used to come up to me and say, hey, what should I watch this weekend? I need something to watch. I need, you know, whatever your recommendation. And I pretty much have, I am think I'm paired with you on like, our likes and dislikes of movies, but I'm pretty good at recognizing other people's likes and dislikes. Like, so, and one of the person said, just start a podcast. And I knew nothing. Like I'm like, Chris, like I know nothing about it. Absolutely nothing. So I got with a buddy and he kind of hooked me up and, you know, I started just right from there. Uh, my first like six months, I didn't even edit my show, which was a big mistake. Cause I didn't know how to edit, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> Looking back, I made a lot of mistakes, but that's how I initially got into it was just people just kept hitting me up with just recommendations and like what I should watch. So I just kind of took it from there. Yeah, you do a good show, man. It's very, it you flow. Like, again, I give you credit. Like, you just continue to talk about whatever you're on. And again, doing it without like, look, I got three of you guys, so I could bounce off each one of you. That to me makes it much easier. I could take a break and let you talk. You, you're just like barreling ahead. Right. I appreciate that. And I tell Chris from time to time, it is, I wish I did have someone more often to bounce stuff off of because it, it, it would make me, my job a little easier. Kind of hard to get content sometimes just for, for me just to blast out 20 to 30 minutes of material. Right. It, that's, it is kind of difficult. I wish I did have like someone. You to, should get a bunch of mirrors. Uh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Like but the, no, it's a, it's a passion. I have fun with it, man. That's what I tell Chris is I just, if one person listens to my podcast, I've done my job because I like doing it. It's a passionate hobby of mine. So I'm just going to keep doing it as long as someone's listening to it. All right. Well, we dig it. Media Mosh, uh, at Shane Media Mosh on Twitter. And you can subscribe and uh, and listen weekly. And uh, Shane's episodes are fairly short, not always, but usually, you said half hour range. So because yeah. I know, I know, you know, we go long, but there are people that prefer those like quick hit as well. So yeah, those are great. Good for the drive, you know, drive to work. Yeah. All right, I Shane, have. we invited you on Pint Movie Invitational. If you listen to the show, you know how that works. If you don't, here's how it works. We get friends, we get people that we know, and we ask them, hey, any movie you want to talk about, pick a movie, come on the show. We talk about it. We've done over 20 of these now. So what movie did you pick to discuss on tonight's episode? I picked the 2007 picture Eastern Promises with Viggo Mortensen and Naomi Watts. Yes, you did. And this is a film that a uh, personal experience of mine, and I'm going to play my cards out a little bit. I saw this in 2007 on video and to my surprise, now see back in the day and I, I was married then. So it wasn't like back in my bachelor days, <laughs> but I was that guy that like every movie I saw that I liked, I would buy on DVD. Like in, I can't do that anymore. And I would like, Hey, I saw this once. I'm going to buy it. I have more DVDs of movies I've seen once than most people. I'm assuming Chris and, and Shane as yeah. well. Cause you raised your hands. Yep. So the other day when you, you know, you had said Eastern Promises and we have to plan on this. Uh, how am I going to watch it? Am I going to have it on you know, Amazon Prime? Is it on Netflix? Do I have to rent it? Which happens a lot. I just went in my back room where my DVDs are and 
Eastern Promises, and I only saw it the once, but guaranteed I was at Best Buy. It was $12, and I said, fuck it. That movie was good. So this was my second time, and I got to finally watch a DVD that I have owned for probably 12 years. So that was a good thing. Uh, real quick before we start, Obviously, Shane, Chris, had you ever seen this before? I have. I think uh, same thing. Uh, saw it on video. Uh, I don't remember seeing it in the theater, but uh, yeah, I saw it once when it came out, and I don't think I've seen it in its entirety up until recently. Manster, I had not seen it nor heard of it. Wow. Okay. Up until you know when you said we're doing it, and so Shane- I watched it twice. You watch it? Did now? Did you watch it twice because you fell asleep? No, I like to watch them twice. You know, just so I could stick it in my memory. Especially if you've guys seen this maybe two, three, four times. Yeah, you know, I like to at least give it more than one shot. Okay, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Shane, what made you choose this movie over every other? And you're a movie guy. Every other movie you've ever seen, what made you scream? Eastern Promises. You know, when you put me on the, when you asked me to come on here, I had literally like tens of titles going through my head and I narrowed it down uh, to a couple uh, go was going to be one of them. And then I was thinking about a history of violence, another Cronenberg Mortensen film. Uh, but then I, I remembered Eastern promises. I just felt like it kind of flew under the radar. It works. On, that movie works on different levels. It's a great character study. It's a crime. It's about the Russian mob, which you don't really get a lot of these days. It was just good storytelling. And I just, again, I felt like a lot of people have not heard of that movie before. And it was one of the best movies in 2007, in my opinion, that more people should know about. So uh, before we get into some of the statistics on this thing, uh, Manster, do you want a bumper sticker what this movie is generally about? Well, you got, um, like you said, the Russian mob. It takes place in London. There is a 14-year-old girl who, in the beginning of the movie, dies during childbirth. The nurse takes over, kind of searching out the family of the baby that's born, which leads her to this um, Russian mob place, uh, a restaurant. And that's where you meet these characters. And you find out some really bad shit happened to her there, including drugs and prostitution and rape. And basically, it's her story of trying to lift this child up. That's very good. That's very good. This is essentially the... the, uh wrong place at the wrong time kind of thing. This nurse gets in, involved with the Russian mafia and, and we'll talk about it more, but she, she doesn't do what a lot of people would do after being warned many times. She just right. keeps going back to the well <laughs> and yeah. hey, good for her. Good for her. So Eastern Promises came out on September 21st, 2007, filmed in and around London, set in London as well. Directed by David Cronenberg. You might know David Cronenberg from uh, a lot of weird sci-fi horror stuff, which this, this is, movie is indicative of his later career. Like, like Shane said, A History of Violence was right before this. This, he did one with Robert Pattinson, uh, Cos- Cosmopolis. Cosmopolis. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So you might know him from The Fly, Scanners, Dead Ringers. Naked um, Lunch. Naked Lunch. Uh, Video Drood. The Brood, absolutely. Uh, what's the one uh, he did that was kind of uh, Stephen King? Uh, Dead Zone. He made Dead, Dead Zone. Yeah. Uh, this was written by Stephen Knight. Stephen Knight is kind of low on the. He hasn't done a lot, but two of the things that he wrote, he also directed. I haven't seen either. I'm familiar with both though. Lock, which is a Tom Hardy movie, which Shane apparently likes. This is the movie Shane where Tom Hardy's just driving around, right? Yes, it's him yeah. by himself. Yep. All right. And you've seen it, Chris? <laughs> uh, no, but I, I know of it. Yeah. Okay. That one I've heard good things about. The other one that he's done, I've heard nothing good about. As a matter of fact, I've heard terrible things about uh, Serenity, not Firefly movie. A couple years ago, starring uh, Anne Hathaway and Matty Mack, <laughs> Matthew McConaughey. I've heard this thing is a dumpster fire. Shane, you have seen this one or no? I stayed away from that one completely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I've heard the ending of this one is it's one of those. I guess I just throw it out there and spoil it. It's one of those like it was all a dream type endings, which obviously pissed yeah, people off exactly. very bad. All right. So the writer, uh, Stephen Knight, wrote and directed those. So, yeah, let's get into it a little bit. Uh, we'll start with the cast. Manster, why don't you get us into who's in this film? And try not to skip anyone this time. Yeah, don't skip <laughs> anybody. <clears throat> all right. Your main star would be uh, Viggo Mortensen as Nikolai. He's a driver slash uh, cleaner 
for the uh, Russian mob. Uh, he's a Danish American actor. You yep. know him from Lord of the Rings, History of Violence, like you said, The Road, Fuck and that movie. tons of other stuff. Yeah, <laughs> so depressing. What most depressing movie ever? Corman McCarthy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, something like that. Cormac. Yeah. Cormac. Yeah. Cormac. Cormac. Yes. Yeah, fucking, that's got a Sorry. depressing scene that we've talked about on other Yes, podcasts. I don't want to think about that scene. No. <laughs> no. Uh, then we have Naomi Watts as Anna, who plays the nurse. Uh, she's a British actress. I've got a question about Naomi Watts real quick. Yep. She's been out for a long time, been around acting. And I've seen her in a you know a bunch of stuff. She was in the King Kong remake in, uh, in, in uh, 05, and she's been in a lot. This might be the first time I've ever seen a movie with her in her, with her in it, where I went, Hmm. She was, I don't know. She kind of hit my radar and kinda hot, you mean kind of hot. And hmm. she deserves a special kind of award for like wearing jeans. Like did he, any of you guys notice while watching this movie? Yeah. When she's parking the uh, motor scooter. Yeah. yeah. Shane, Shane yeah. you noticed her oh, ability. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. She really wears a pair of jeans better than most people. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. She, uh, she looked pretty good in um, tank girl. She was Jet Girl. Oh, I the saw, other girl. saw Tank Girl in the movies once. Yeah. yeah. Once. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to revisit it. I'm yeah, sure there's no. stills on, on the, the internet. There you go. But uh, yeah, she uh, she looks good with dark hair, I'll tell you. I think there because you know. she, she was very natural looking. She, they wasn't, there was no glamour really involved. Right. Yeah. Was very natural beauty. Agreed. And, yeah. Yeah, it really kind of jumped out. In this film. Kind of jumped out at me in this one, yeah. which, which, you know, it's just weird because she's never really jumped out at me before. All right. Yeah. The first thing I remember her from is The Ring. Yeah, me too. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. true. That was the thing that put her over, I think. Yeah. Uh, then you have Vincent Cassell. Uh, now, he played mm -hmm. Carol. Now, I know him most recently from uh, Westworld. He played a character called Serac. Uh, by the way, he's 10 days younger than I am. 10? 10 days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's a French actor. Yep. I don't see where Vincent I'm going looks better. Danish actor, British actor, French actor. Uh, he was in Ocean's 12, Ocean's 13, Black Swan, tons of foreign films. He's known also from the second and third Matrix films. He was uh, those two. He was one of the shitty characters in those movies, yeah. And in real he life... He's a great uh, shitty character. Yeah. And in real life, he was married to, but not any longer... What's her name? The Italian actress. Is Monica Bellucci. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 So good on him. <laughs> Right, good on this guy. Good on that guy. Yeah, He's a smoker. Yep, yeah. well, he La plays France. the the son of the. Uh, I, I guess he, he's a mobster, the Russian Vor guy. Yeah, the Vor, the Vori V Zakone is yeah. what this Russian mob in particular is called. Vori V Zakone. There's a lot of terms that I was unfamiliar with in this movie. Yeah, well, there's a lot of this movie as well that's in subtitled Russian. So yep. <clears throat> if you don't like to read subtitles, this is not a fully subtitled movie but you are going to get scenes that are spoken in the Russian language. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have his father, Armin Mueller Stahl as Semon. Uh, he's the, like I just said, the Russian boar, basically an elite professional criminal. Uh, now he's a German actor, writer, and director, you know, lots of foreign films as well. He was fantastic in this movie. So he plays this, the elder, obviously he's the leader of this, of this group of this of these gangsters he also runs this restaurant that's kind of his front and you see him as like this jovial kind of russian grandfather character mm -hmm. yep. through a lot of it and at first when she first meets him she's kind of like you know enamored by him because he's teaching his little granddaughters how to play violin and he's very charming but then when the switch turns and he wants to know things like you know, where do you live? I know how to find you. You suddenly see that this is a guy. And then when you find out what he did, this is a guy that's not to be fucked with in any way, shape or form. And exactly. I like that duality of it right away. He's like, I'll do that and I'll yeah. do this for you and I'll take you home. And you immediately know that you know he, he needs to get in there and get whatever she's got. Right. Uh, then you got Sinead Cusack as Helen. Uh, that's the nurses and his mother. Uh, she's an Irish film, stage, and TV actress. Uh, she was married to Jeremy Irons in 1978. Oh, wow. They even had a couple children. Mina E. Mina as Azim. He was the barber who I, yes. I've recognized from other roles. Uh, he's an Egyptian actor. Uh, he was in The 13th Warrior. 
oh. Chronicles of Riddick. And again, a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, I thought you liked that. I know you like the 13th Warrior. I do. I haven't seen it in a while. I got to watch it again. All right, a couple more. Uh, Jersey Skolimowski as Stepan. He was the uncle living with um, you know Naomi Watts' character. He's a Polish actor, screenwriter, and director. He was in Mars Attacks, uh, The Avengers. And he gave off, to me anyway, a bit of an older Kurt Russell vibe. Any of you guys get that? <laughs> Older, fat, drunk Kurt Russell. Yeah, older, fatter <laughs> Kurt Russell. He, that character has a line in that movie that... Are you and, talking and, about at the table? The yes. racist line? Yeah. Oh, God, yes. Right, Shane, what does he say that nobody on earth should ever say to anybody? And please, Shane, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but place it nicely for the audience because right. it's terrible. If I can remember it correctly, they, Naomi Watts has a history. She's divorced or she left her husband doctor, boyfriend doctor, and she had child. She was pregnant at one time and she lost the child. And uh, Stefan basically says it's because you – mixed your race with uh, someone different than you, and that's why you lost the baby. Wow. <laughs> right. Seeing that scene for the second time, because I don't remember it the first time I saw it, but the second time I was like, holy shit. <laughs> really? There was, there, to their credit, there was both ladies of, got up and yeah. Yeah. walked out and screamed at him for saying that. Right. Lindsay, like, again, I always say it, Lindsay's half watching these movies with me, <laughs> and, you know, I you see what? her. Yeah, she's like watching over and, you know, reading and then asking me a question. And then he said that and she's like, what? I'm like, <laughs> wow. He just Ugh. he just said the worst thing anybody's ever said to somebody. And he's her uncle. So this isn't right. like yeah. this isn't like he's like some bigoted guy who's talking to somebody. He's just or being KGB. To. Yeah, he to, claims to be a KGB. So he says. Holy right. cow. To Auxiliary. Be fair, he, he played the drunk uncle very well. He did. Because drunk uncles always say the most inappropriate things. Ugh. All right. Anybody else, Master? Yeah, I'll go with one more. Um, but before I do, uh, go into that drunk uncle thing. <laughs> when they introduced these characters, I, I probably, you know, in her house eating dinner or something, I thought for the longest time that was the mother and father. Yeah, I okay? thought so the same. I mean, they do say the word uncle at some point, and then they come back to it later. But I thought it was a very odd situation. And then I have a theory about why they did that. And I guess we can get into that later. I, di I didn't because when he spoke, when she spoke to Armin Mueller Saul, they were talking about her father. And I thought that she said he had died. Yeah, right. And you're, right? Didn't he? Like said, your father is, is Russian. You're, like uh, right. Iva Iv Ivanova yep. of John, right? Mm -hmm. I guess at the beginning, I wasn't sure who the relation was. But then when he said that terrible remark, she takes the vodka from him and says, you're just like your brother. Yep. Uh, yeah. Stinking Russian. Yeah. I think yep. a lot of things, the first time I saw this, a lot of things got lost on me with a lot of the Russian accents, a lot of things I didn't hear, you know, a lot because of the accents. And yeah. I was to out what people were saying. And I feel like a lot of the, the dialogue was uh, spoken low. Yes. Especially uh, Armin, who... Uh, very soft spoken. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's, that's his character, but I'm just like, what did they say? What? And I thought it was just me, but yeah, there's certain things that you, you miss because of yeah. the accents and I picked up a lot dialogue. more on the second time, especially because I also put on the subtitles the second time around. <laughs> right. Much easier to follow. Yeah. Uh, and finally, the last guy is going to be Donald Sumter as Yori. He's the uh, British government official. You see him a couple times in the movie. Again, two scenes, the first yeah. time is when they find yeah. the body that comes up in the river. Um, he's an English actor. Uh, he was in The Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. He was Doctor Who, or in Doctor Who for quite a while, the early ones. In, in Game of Thrones, he was Meister Lewin. Oh, okay, yeah. I, I know who you're talking about. One of the doctors, right? Grand Meister? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, Shane, we talked about <clears throat> there are two major things that happen in the beginning of this movie that set the two kind of subplots coming together. The first one we talked about where the young girl goes into a pharmacy, has a miscarriage. Well, not a miscarriage. She is bleeding and then she dies, gives birth. The baby survives. What was, uh, was it Anna? Was that her character's yeah, Anna, name? Anna, yeah. the nurse. Anna finds her journal, which in the journal, 
it basically is this young girl's journal written that points in written in Russian that points out the fact that she was forced into prostitution, drugs, and the reason she was pregnant is she was raped by the Armin Mueller Stahl character. So the Armin Mueller Stahl character is very concerned about this journal getting in the wrong hands. What was the second thing, Shane, that kind of sets everything off? Well, the oh, it was actually you mean yeah, the first thing, really, right? The actual right, first yeah. thing, yes. Yeah. It's, uh, I believe you're talking about the, the barbershop scene. Correct. Right, where you have, let me get this, this guy's name because I forget his name. The young guy, Ekram, I guess. I guess his yeah, uncle that's said the he's, boy. he's touched or he's special. Yeah. He's in the barbershop with his uncle and they're giving this guy a shave. And all of a sudden, uh, you get one of the most gruesome uh, throat slicing scenes you'll see in a movie. Because it wasn't like you'd normally see a clean no. lit. Yeah, he was sawing like at it. Sawing on his yeah on his throat and i guess that's someone from a different uh russian uh sector or different part of the mob that he took out so that kind of sets that part of the russian mob story into motion so we have the baby in the journal on one end and then we have a hit within like the family essentially and why did it happen as shane pointed out i want to point this out so in in america you know in 2020 You know, and I get it. We have all of these politically correct and incorrect terms. Nobody knows whether to say mentally challenged. When I was a kid, it was mentally retarded was okay then. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't want to say, and I'm saying this just for the show, you know, calling someone a retard was not right. But like mentally retarded was a phrase. Now that's gone. Well, in Russia, apparently, they just go and make it sound really nice. They, They claim... It was touched by angels. Touched by, an by angel. angels. Touched by angels. Yeah. Like, wow. So I guess the show, Touched by an Angel, in yeah. maybe in Russia, <laughs> Touched by an Angel is what was the show with Corky on it? Get a, was oh, it um, God. Get a, uh, Life Goes On? Life, life Goes On. on. Yes. So in Russia, Life Goes On is called Touched by an Angel, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> um, it's just, hey, it's just one of these things, you know, and that's one of the cool things about this movie is it doesn't take place in America. It's heavily about a Russian culture, but it's like a displaced Russian family exactly. in London. But we exactly. don't even know really why they're there. Right. So usually you might get a, a tale of a Russian family and it's going to be in Russia. These people are not even where they're where they would normally be. They're in London. So there's a lot going on here. There's a there's a lot going on. All right. We you notice get, the first thing that kid does when he comes in. He shuts the shades and the blinds on the door. Turns the open that guy sign. Should have been immediately alerted. Hey, I better get the hell out of here. I thought the same thing in the in that scene. So he's sitting in the in the chair, getting his hair cut, probably by a guy who cuts his hair all the time. I'm assuming he knows the guy. Azim. The kid comes in, shuts the curtain, turns the sign around, <clears throat> and then nervously with like a paper in front of him, he's got a weapon, but you he doesn't know that. And I thought to myself, this guy is taking this like in stride i would be nervous but then later in the movie when you start to realize that this kid is mentally challenged that makes you wonder if if that's why the guy wasn't weirded out by him acting a little different you know what i mean if he knew that's how you took it right yeah yeah he expects this kind of behavior um he didn't expect him to fucking saw his head (laughs) off (laughs) right two really good gore scenes involving that guy number one the saw through you know or the 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 blade through the throat number two when kirill and nikolai are going to get rid of the body the scene where nikolai cuts the finger off yeah the fingertips it looked i mean again i can't claim to know what real looks like in that but that looked as real as i would real enough yeah you saw the bone. It was gross. <laughs> it was really gross. He's, he's smoking a out. cigarette the whole time. Yeah, he's smoking a cigarette the whole time. Yeah, he's, well. I'd be smoking, too, if I had a dead body I had to cut up. I couldn't do it. No. Yeah, I'm with Shane. I'm with Shane. He had to pull all the teeth out. Yeah. Right? The, let's he just, offered. Let's get into it real quick. He did offer. Nikolai is the Viggo Mortensen character. Now, I'm not, we're not going to play this like the movie. All right? We're going to get right into it. You, you get this character in this movie who is, you're assuming from dialogue and stuff, a fairly new addition to the family. He is Kirill's bodyguard slash chauffeur. And obviously, whatever else, body disposal, all that stuff. But you get through 
a sense in the film that he's someone not to be fucked with, right? Definitely. He's, he's just menacing, even though to Anna, he's repeatedly nice to her every time he deals with her. But, and he seems to be, uh, I want to say this real quick. So seeing this movie a second time and knowing the eventual twist in the movie makes you watch this movie in a totally different way. Shane, do you agree with that? Absolutely. Because the first time, what you don't know in this movie and you don't find out until the very end, literally 15 minutes left. And it's, it is one of the most non bombastic reveals ever. It's yeah. just in a conversation. You find out that Viggo Mortensen's character who is in the mob has cut up a dead body, helped dispose of the dead body has had sex with underage. It appears prostitutes and done other things that are not savory is an undercover cop. He is essentially Scotland Yard's undercover division that has, in, he's Donnie Brasco, right? Right, yeah. Blew my I mind. That, the first, the time. first time I watched it, that I didn't get it until the very end, right? But the second time you watch it through, you could pick up hints throughout, like you said, the first sex scene where he has to get like, Kirill has to uh, initiate him so he's not gay, right? Right. He says so. He has sex. Uh, the most awkward, one of the most awkward sex scenes I've seen. That yes. was awful. Uh, yeah. One of the, the the points from this movie is Viggo Mortensen in this movie is not a good lovemaker. He's very unrhythmic. <laughs> like the doggy style scene, he didn't have it. Then I thought at one point he's going to put a sleeper hold on her. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but at the end of it, I think they were trying really hard to decentralize that right. whole scene. But I laughed at it. Then he throws a car to her. You know, it's not, that's the first scene you say, okay, there's something different about this guy. He's actually trying to help her out, which I totally missed the first time I saw this movie. Me too. Right. There's a lot that I missed when I first saw this because, like, I, watching it again, I feel like everything is given to you. Everything is presented to you uh, very openly from the beginning. And I could have swore in hindsight – Oh, you didn't get all the revelation until the end. It's like, no, there's in this journal, uh, a lot is said. And guess what? The baby is so and so's. You know, it's just like, oh, they say it pretty early. Yeah, and you that know? wasn't really too hard to figure out. I mean, right. I, I could tell well, that same considering moments. the talk. Yeah. But when because she left the the place the very first time, I'm like, that dude is the girl's father, uh, that baby's father. No, no doubt. But also uh, watching it this time. I'm almost, and because of that lovemaking scene, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, I looked at it differently. Like, uh, I look at it like maybe Vigo liked Kirill. No, I didn't get vice that versa. Sense. I didn't get that sense. No. You didn't get that this time? No, not at all. No. You know, listen, he's a virile man. We get to see that later. Uh, later. Right, but, um, no. Vigo was there just to do what he had to do to prove to know. Kirill that he's on the well, other side. Why not take him down, too? Why? Why just go for the? Because the, he could play. He could snake, play. You know? He could play Kareel more than he could play Kareel. Yeah. Dad. So and we're going to jump to this movie. Leaves that all open too. Right. right. Very right. open. Very open. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. he like Viggo's character is assuming he's going to be the top of this on this pyramid when it's all said and done. Yeah. Right. Oh, no, I I just looked at that scene differently. Yeah, I agree. Know. I agree that he understood. That so we're gonna jump all around and that's fine. Yeah, At the end of this movie, Armin Mueller's what's his name, Lloyd, the grandfather, Semyon. Semyon's character ends up going, getting taken to jail for for the rape of this young girl, which they don't show any of that. Which they don't no. show, but they it's just, all inferred. It's all, assumed. it's all assumed, and I got the same idea: is that Nikolai wants Kirill in charge because he knows he's gonna, he's not gonna last very long. He's going to be, and then Nikolai, even though, you, you know, this, this is going to sound funny. So there's a scene halfway through this movie where Semyon, and I, you know what, I, I can reach back and remember not realizing this, even though it's right there in the movie, like you said before. So there's a scene where Semyon promotes Nikolai from driver to essentially a captain, which you get your stars, tattoos over your heart. And on your knees, you know, the heart means it's in your heart. The knees mean you, you will never bow before another man, right? He does all of that. And the first time I saw it, I just thought, 
oh yeah, well, he sees this guy as useful. In the end, it's actually a trick into trying to get... It's a big setup. Oh, it's a big setup, which... Yep, absolutely. Seeing it this time, I'm like, fuck, I did not get that at all the Me first either. time. I'm with you. I missed it the, the, the first time. That's why the whole Russian it. death scene really yes. threw me the first time. I'm like, yep. I, I understand what's going on, but I don't get why. Right. All right. I, I feel better. Too. I feel better. Chris, did you did you get that right off the bat or no? No, I didn't. Like I said, I, I, I can't believe, like, I thought there was all this grand mystery with the, the movie when I first watched it. But now it's just like, how did I miss that? Yeah, you know how yeah. did I, this movie how takes I really it? two two viewings, and they should be <laughs> right one after another. Yeah, to really to really understand every nuance. So yeah. w- what we were just talking about, well, Shane, why don't you explain the setup that happens and what we were talking about with him getting the tattoos? Okay, so the first event that we talked about, the chopping of the throat, set things in motion. So the other faction wants to get back at uh, Sim- Simone, and they want to take out Kirill. But they don't know it what Nikolai... Because really Kirill that right. before the movie yeah, were... somehow set, set, that, up, set yeah. that up. Yeah. Uh, and they don't know what Nik- Nikolai looks like. So the father has a grand idea. Well, since they don't know what they, he looks like, we're going to promote him. And since the Russian mob, they have their story and their history tattooed all over their body that this is going to be uh, Kirill. So he gets sent to the bathhouse and he gets trying, they try to set up a hit. So he gets killed so Kirill could live. Right. So, yeah, right. And that leads up to one of the most cringeworthy scenes I've ever seen in my life is, and if you've ever heard of Eastern Promises without seeing it, I'm going to assume you know it as the naked fucking fight scene. <laughs> you get the full Morty. The follow full the, Morty. Yeah, follow, follow the nutsack. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, Azim, the barber, who now owes Semyon a debt because he fucked up earlier in the movie, he agrees to set up um, Nikolai as Kareel to the two brothers of the guy whose head got cut. The Chechens. The Chechens, whose, whose throat yeah. got cut. They go to a bathhouse, and he he doesn't sell it, but Azim's like, I'll tell you the rest of the story after I go yeah, to the bathroom. Yeah, they're talking about the bathroom. TVs yeah. with, with uh, cargo inside them. and yeah. And, and, and Vigo asks him a question, and it seems to amuse Azim as he gets up and goes to the bathroom. Gets up, goes to the bathroom, starts getting on a full three. I would just get on shorts and a shirt and get the yeah. fuck out. He gets on a full yeah, his tie suit. on. He's got a tie. <laughs> I have and to uh, go take a dump. It's, it's, in, it's, a, it's a number two with a high water quotient. <laughs> I'll tell you the rest after I wipe. I had the, I had the borscht for lunch, and that fucks me up. <laughs> so... so Here's one scene in this into- whole movie that, and I like this movie. So when we get to the end of it, we'll talk about that. I like yeah. this movie that didn't ring a hundred percent true to me was, I guess Viggo Mortensen's character would have no reason to think that Azim had set him up, but from the way he was acting, I would have been a little weirded out. Right. You guys. Yes. Yeah. And they established and- that Viggo Mortensen's character is smart. And he can yeah, he, wa- he walked out he of the way. Going on. He got out around the corner so he wouldn't be spotted. Right. Not only does Viggo Mortensen's character not see something coming, he goes, takes his towel all the way off <laughs> and then like sits and does the Schwitz, right? Yeah. And now you have all of a sudden <clears throat> the two brothers, one kind of wiry guy and one fucking like man mountain guy. Yep. They show up in this steam room and Nikolai is totally naked. Linoleum Dead. knives, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Those are no- yes. linoleum knives. Curved, hooked linoleum knives. Yep. And they attack him. And every time anybody got hit or cut with a knife, particularly Mortensen, because he was naked, I felt it 10 times more. Yeah. Like, yep. they give him a cut right across the ribs to begin. And I just went, oh, Shane, like the, first, you, the first word I thought of was vulnerable. Like you cannot feel more vulnerable right. being naked and unarmed. Yes. You know, right. and, and this, with hard you slippery floors. Right. <laughs> right. You're sweaty. You know, you got a good base going on and there's slippery floors. <laughs> and you're just vulnerable and, and you're naked. So like that is like the most uh, animalistic scene I think I've seen in a while. I remember walking away from the movie thinking, God, Damn, like I don't know what I like that that scene just blew my mind. 
Yeah. yeah, I tell you, I, I give Vigo a lot of credit for that because never mind the naked part. I mean, that's bad enough. But to be running around in this hard floor where you're getting knocked over, you're falling down, you're slipping. I mean, mm. try and get down on the floor now just wearing right. shorts. Right. Yeah. Yes. And <laughs> it needs I, hurt just doing that. Since I saw this movie, and I've been spouting this for years, I thought he should have won an Oscar for this for doing his role just for right. doing that scene yeah most a-list actors would not do that scene period yeah no there's no way i'm doing that he had to be like early 40s and uh doing my research he was actually nominated that year for best actor yeah, yeah he lost yep. to daniel day lewis for and there will be blood, blood. Yep. yeah i yep. drink your milkshake <laughs> right but cronenberg actually said the way he shot this this scene this bathhouse scene the way he left Vigo naked was it was truer to the movie that he set up until this point. So he didn't want any modesty going on in there up until this point from what he set forth. So I was like, that makes sense. Like he set this like gritty underworld of Russian mob. So he's not going to do cut scenes and like make Viggo cross his legs or anything like that. Mm -hmm. He just wants it to come across honest and as truthful as he directed up until this no. point. I was like, and that makes total sense. And he did a good job of doing edits where you can see his dick and balls, but it's <laughs> yes. never it it's very quick. Flash. It's very yeah, quick yeah. because a scene like that. OK, so, yes, it is infamous for being a naked fight scene. You do get to see flashes of his penis, which you don't see in many Hollywood movies. But Cronenberg was smart the way he did it because he never focused on that because that would take away. Then it would be, oh, this is the scene where you see Viggo Mortensen's dick for five minutes. Right. It's not known as that. It's more right. known because he's naked in a brutal fight scene. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, I got a question for you. What's that? Did you cringe even a little when he jabbed that dude in the eye? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just like... Uh... You know, this is him this over is him, right thinking he was dead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm just like, oh my god, uh, totally forgot about that. I was thinking up until this point, this is the most tame Cronenberg's ever been, and then all of a sudden he does that. I'm just like, okay, yeah, he's back. No, you yeah. still make a good point because when I first saw this movie, you know, when I thought about it, I was like, man, that was pretty good, and it had violent. But when you go back and watch it, it doesn't. It's like probably his least violent movie he's done to date. Like. Yeah. His violent scenes are graphic and they're there, but they're very far and few between the story. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's there's quick. two it's next slices. Shot and then go. Right. Yeah, I, exactly right. I made a note yeah. here. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lloyd. No, I was just saying there's really only three. Right. Yeah. I made a note here and I, as I did a little research, it tied into that. So this is a movie essentially about a mob, right? A mafia. And it's told largely from their side. What's something that does not exist in this movie? guns no, yeah, no guns. guns right no guns and then as i read about i was reading apparently a lot of the russian mob in these like like the the vori Z, v Zicone, and a lot of these factions they don't use knives or they're they don't use the knives them. they're all it's about the knives all about yeah. the knives because the knives are harder to be convicted with they're uh i i guess the reason they use those kind of knives like the like the what were they called linoleum linoleum yeah. knives is because uh, some of them would, I guess, as a job, be linoleum contractors yeah. and cutters. Just yeah. say, yeah, yeah we're, we cut linoleum. Yeah, because there's not a ah, gun in this whole fucking movie, ever. Right. And that's unusual for a crime movie following any type of mob. A mob, right, exactly yeah. right. All right, so that's very cool. I also want to point out, and I remember this from the first time, but it had been years, my new go-to Nonverbal threat to a person is this. Put your fingers up like the peace yeah. sign, right? Yeah. Like you know you can't see me. So put your fingers up like the peace sign. Yep. Turn your hand around. Point your fingers at your neck and point at whoever you want to understand <laughs> that you're gonna kill him. Because Mortensen does that to the uncle character at one point after the uncle character spits in his face. And it gives me chills because he actually scares me when he does it. And Lindsay actually said to me, I, and I love my wife, she goes, what did that mean? I'm like, that meant I'm going to fucking kill you. <laughs> you know? and it also means you're drunk or I'm drunk because I looked it up. I'm just like, is that oh. really a saying? Does that and, mean uh, like you're drunk? It like it says, uh, you know, you're, you're going to die, but it also means I'm drunk or I'm, I'm going to be drunk or something like Listen, that. If someone so did like, that to me on the street, like did this and pointed yeah. at me. 
Like, I'm giving him a wide berth. I'm thinking like, they're I'm going to the other way. <laughs> yeah. right. If Shane's giving this guy a wide berth, I'm giving him a bigger <laughs> wide berth. All right? Shane. I'm staying at home. You are, yeah. you, you are a trainer, right? Do you work in one gym in particular? Yes, I do. Have you ever seen a fight of even remotely that tenacity in a gym locker room before? Oh. <laughs> no, but I uh, – no. Now you're talking about the bath scene? The bath yes. The scene? Yeah. No, <laughs> not with the knives. But if you're talking like fisticuffs, uh, I saw plenty of those at Fort Bragg. Yes. I've okay. Seen, yeah, I've seen knockout dragouts hmm. <laughs> more than I care to remember at Fort Bragg. <laughs> I got the feeling, Manster, from talking to you – that you didn't really care for this movie. And I kind of want to, I kind of want to find out if you didn't and what your problem was with it, because you're wrong. And I want to argue. <laughs> I will save my points to the end. Okay. All right. Because I have two feelings about this movie. I liked it less the first time. Once I understood more what the movie was trying to show me, I liked it better, but there's a lot of points that I could bring up that I thought was either lazy writing or things of that nature. So you're saying I, this isn't one of your favorite Christmas movies? It's probably my very favorite Christmas movie. This, okay. This, as I watched this, I did not remember the first time that this was set at Christmas time. No. And I, I thought what, like if this movie was even slightly more popular, where would it be all the people going? This is a Christmas movie, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, hard Eastern Promises. That's yeah. how it goes. I watch yeah. Eastern Promises every Christmas and go to sleep depressed and drunk. <laughs> yeah, the funny thing is, the first time I saw this movie, I saw it as a Russian mob movie. The second time I saw it, I I realized the impact they're trying to show with the sex trafficking. That's like the main, actually, the main point of the movie is trying yeah. to break up the sex trafficking ring which I totally missed the first yeah. time I saw this movie because yeah. they kind of show it subtext. It's not like the text. They, they have certain scenes like with big old sex scene and other parts that actually, you know, the 14 year old giving birth. But other than that, it's like a, I took it as like a straight up mob movie where Naomi Watts got herself entangled in the mob, but it's really about sex trafficking and saving these girls, which I right. realized more the second time. That seems to be kind of, the main operation that Mortensen's character right. is infiltrating this group for is it almost seems like, so in a lot of movies you have, you know, <clears throat> Scarface, he's a, he's a cocaine distributor, dealer, all that stuff. This isn't, these people aren't drug runners or drug dealers. These people trade women. They make a joke early in, well, not a joke. They make a passing line early in the movie that they traded a girl for a bunch of brandy. Right. right? Yeah. You know, like, it's so it's said in such like uh flip it, like just flippant flippant line disregard. yeah right. let's drink to the girl yeah right flippant disregard but, you know, the, the story i think kind of like what you're saying is you know it's about cruel people who are just overcome with with moral rot and then it just shows <clears> you that there's a bright side you know a little spot of redemption that can rise up among the rut and and that's the good thing uh, really about this movie that's right I mean. right i i personally think this is naomi watts probably best performance she's done on screen uh as anna i like all these characters because she's like i don't want to say like unassuming but she's kind of passive but yet she sets the story forward with being not knowingly but being uh pushing back against Simeon. yeah she's pushing knowing. quite a bit oh yeah right yeah. so she she's told to give up Right, she but she keeps propelling the story forward, but she's kind—I don't want to say kind of meek, but she is just unassuming. And I, I loved her in this in this movie, really. And then you have Kareel, who has major daddy issues. He has yeah. a lot of issues. Yeah. Right. It comes out he's homosexual. Yeah. Uh, I like the scene where Kare- uh, Nikolai's getting promoted, and Kareel doesn't know, so Nikolai tells him. And Kirill's like, oh, you don't think I know what's going on? He's like, I'm born with these stars. You know, I don't think Kirill really wants that part of his life. I don't think he wants that life, but he's born into it. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of, I just like the different character story arcs in here and, and their, their, their backgrounds and where they're going. So yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I read Kirill as a really privileged brat. Who will oh, just yeah. do anything he can because he can get away with it. Right. I always thought he was uh, seeking his dad's approval. Oh, yeah. Uh, he is. I, I mean, they do him. make a thing out of, I think they call it queer, not so much gay, but they make a thing out of that. And I wonder if they even needed to. Well, I, but I see, I, I think there's certain parts in this movie and seeing it the second time made more sense to me. So 
if you get into the Kirill stuff, there's little things that like go along with Shane's thing about the approval. The fact that, so in the end of the movie, you kind of, they don't say it, but they infer heavily that the little girl that he was teaching violin or that Samyan was teaching violin to earlier is Kirill's daughter. And because, you know, he keeps calling, you know, go, go to bed, go upstairs. And, and, you know, you get the feeling, even though it's never said, that's his daughter. And that works twofold because that scene sets up the fact that he has a kid, which is going to make it harder for him to kill the baby at the end, which, you know, he, he's, he can't even do it. Yeah. Right. I'm also sorry, makes, baby. It also makes you think, though, that at some point he went out and got a girl pregnant just to have a kid to maybe get his dad not thinking he's gay. Right. But it also, in the journal, says that uh, Kirill could not rape her because he was queer. Yeah. You know, oh, his father yeah. had to finish it. And then it's, he it tried said to get he... Big O to fuck that girl to prove that he was not queer as well. So I think that was him trying to look, hey, can you really do it? I think it was twofold. I think it was twofold. He wanted Vigo to fuck the prostitute to prove he's not queer to be part of them. And he also liked Vigo and right. wanted to see him get down. <laughs> I mean, uh, he, it's, that's but, part of it too. Yeah. But also, I, again, looked at it like maybe Vigo was just like mashing it because he's, he's not into her. No, he was put under pressure. Well, she clearly, she clearly was into it. If you yeah. read your body language or the whole thing, <laughs> she's like, she's like, got her. Yeah, <laughs> he put her in a half yeah. Nelson at one point. Yeah. It was. Yeah. I think she's filing her nails. <laughs> it was weird. It was totally weird. And there was a second there. There was a second there where I thought maybe he's not like actually fucking her. But knowing what you know earlier and how hard it is for him to infiltrate this, he's gonna do whatever he has mm. to do. So he did it. Yeah. You know, he was doing it no matter what. Now, yeah. I want to bring up something else about Viggo Mortensen that I really appreciated in this movie. As Shane said, the tattoos tell the story of a Russian mobster's life. There's a scene where he's being evaluated by the the, uh, the higher ups to become a captain. And he's in his black trunks and everything else is out. And they're talking about his um, his tattoos. And he was Siberian. He was in a Siberian gulag or a jail. And they discussed that. Something I liked about this movie is that Viggo Mortensen, for his age, is in really good shape. He looks great. But they didn't, like, do that Hollywood thing where they where they went and hired Shane and got him, like, six-pack ripped, right? Did any of you guys think that? Like, I like the fact that they made him a healthy-looking guy but not like, you know, his shirt's off and he's fucking destroyed, ripped, and, you know, he, he flexes and all the girls just drop in their panties. He's not Brad Pitt. He's not right. Brad Pitt. Right club. He looks like... But that a, is so unrealistic. That but that's, that's, that's what I'm saying, is Brad Pitt and Fight Club's physique is that way because he's not real. He is the ideal of what Edward Norton would want to see as an alpha male. Shane, yeah. perfect question for you. What are those, like hip muscles that guys can get they well uh the name for the common name for his gi joe lines okay all right <laughs> you're talking about those lines you that, that carry yeah that in, yeah yes. gi joe lines that's what we call them brad pitt has gi joe lines because major Ed, gi joe line yes because <laughs> edward norton he had to be that way in that movie right i was glad that morton's character didn't have that because but when morton was sitting getting his tattoos he just had one crease going across his stomach line. Yep. Yeah. Right. Just one. It is yep. very small. That means he's got very little body fat. Right. But he's not, what I'm saying is he's not overdone. No, right. he, he looks yeah. great. I wish I looked like that. Yeah. Maybe. I still didn't finish the other half of the cake that I was eating. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple other things about this movie that I wanted to point out that I found unusual. During, there's a scene towards the end where it's a, I think they said a hundred year old Russian woman's party. Who the fuck was the Russian Fabio on accordion? Yeah, right. That guy had oh, the God. biggest mouth and lips ever. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know if she was into it or she was just like, listen, I know I'm 100, but let me just die now. Yeah. This, guy's- <laughs> this, this guy, is, if you've never seen the movie, there's just I a mean, scene. I liked him, though. Yeah. He's, he's like the in-house entertainment. He looks like, he looks like, I don't know, his hair doesn't fit his face and he's playing an accordion and he's singing in Russian. The whole thing's a fucking mess. Um <laughs> <laughs> and another thing oh two things that i i picked up in the scene i read about this but i also 
made sure to look for it before I had announced it here or say it here. In the fight scene, in the steam bath, if you look on Viggo Mortensen's left upper shoulder, you could see his elvish tattoo. Oh, he didn't cover it up. Right. He didn't cover it up. That. Yeah. Huh. So uh, if you don't know, if you're listening, the nine, the fellowship of the nine, except for John Rice Davies, all got the same elvish tattoo on a different spot in their body. John Rice Davies had his stuntman. His stuntman oh. did it. He oh. didn't do it. <laughs> I was so, going to say, uh, he had an Indiana Jones back tattoo. Yes, yeah. He has a giant poster of Temple of Doom, and then he realized <laughs> that he wasn't in that one. He <laughs> wasn't in that one. <laughs> Shit. He didn't ask me for that I one. I was not in that one. That's the one with the young Asian boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, if you look, you can see the Elvish tattoo on the top of his arm in the scene where he's crawling over uh, the guy right before the guy grabs him again. Elvish Presley. Elvish Presley. <laughs> And one more thing, something I learned about London, England uh, in this movie that I just I never knew before in any movie. I'd never been to London, but any movie I've ever seen about London is that in London, apparently there are alleyways between buildings that just lead right into the river river. Right. I didn't know that either. (laughs) Like, why are there stairs coming out of it? Is and, that a- and why are you throwing dead bodies in a river? Yeah. Well, he says the current's going to take them right yeah. out there. Yeah. Bullshit. I mean, they're going to be found, <laughs> right? I was like, wow, that that body's not going down. Well, he that meant body's it to be not fa- going down. He and- meant it to be found, though. Remember, yeah. he meant yes. it to be found. Yeah. 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 Another thing I wanted to add was uh, not that it's a, a big to do. She was in it for like two seconds, but Tatiana uh, Maslani was the yeah. was the, the pregnant girl. On Orphan Black, she uh, she's known to be uh, the the lead actress. She yeah. was only the voice. She right. wasn't the actor who portrayed the girl. She oh, was the voiceover see? while she was reading her journal. Speaking of which, uh, Armin, uh, maybe it was just my copy. It seemed like his uh, voice was dubbed throughout the whole thing. And I've heard him like, before. Yeah, no, so have I. But I was just like, why is he the only one that sounds like, you know, all right, we're going to have to bring in uh, ADR. You talk too softly. <laughs> I didn't have that, but... No? Now, that's no. what I liked about his character in this movie, though, because he was so subtle and so soft-spoken. And his eyes were they're so expressive. Right. But the <clears throat> first scene I knew where he meant business is when um, Anna was in the hospital with the, uh, the kid, uh, the baby, and he comes in. He's like, how'd you get in here? And he's like, there are always doors open, Anna. I was like, yeah. oh, shit, this guy means business. Well, <laughs> and not just that. So he gets in, makes that comment. He's obviously being very low-key threatening. And then he goes over to the crib. I mean, I've seen this movie before, but I was like, oh, shit, he's going to, like, crush this kid's head or some shit. Like, he's just going to do it right now. He, Yeah, he was very good in this. He was. I think all the performances in this thing are pretty, uh, pretty top-notch. Yeah, absolutely, because sure. he makes it. The- we're talking about Kirill being queer, but remember, Simeon makes a comment about London and why they're there. He said, this is a city of whores and queers. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I found that very interesting. And like Kirill, like battling his inner demons with his father. And this was after Vigo had told him that it's you know, what was- he said about his son that set up that whole other. Uh, right. With the right. Chickens. Well, when when Azim, uh, I think Vic, well, I think Semyon asked Azim what why um, he went along with Kirill and killed the the guy in the barber chair. He said because you know they had said something about uh, about Kirill and Azim was like nervous and he he didn't say queer. He said he said that he's a drunk and he was about to say something else, but he was afraid. To say, oh, and they're saying well, he, he's queer, right. too, because, like, being a drunk is one thing, but to Semyon, yeah. being homosexual is, like, you know, that might that's be it. a, that's it, yeah. And if you remember what Kirill told, Kirill told Nikolai why they killed him, they, they, Nik, uh, Kirill told Nikolai they killed him because he was a pedophile. Yeah. You remember yeah. that scene? No. Well, he that's spit at him or he did something. Him. He said pederast. Yeah. yeah pederast. And I looked at yeah. him as pedophile. Yeah. So he explained to Nikolai they took him out because he was a pedophile. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. To cover the fact that Nick, you know, he probably knew Creel was homosexual. Wow. I can't wait to get into this a little bit further with Manster to find out what the fuck his problem is. <laughs> yeah. What is your problem? <laughs> with this wonderful. <laughs> well, I can tell this... you the points I had right now if you want. Well, let's, yeah, let's take a but second. But I don't have a problem with the movie. I mean, I think the movie's really good. All right. Let's, let's go talk about your points and discuss your points. 
All right. All right. We talked a little about a couple of these things already. The uncle throwing the bodies in the Thames. The scene with Nikolai fucking the women. I think that whole scene was not really necessary. I kind of understand why they went there. I think that scene was necessary for for later on for when you find out he's a cop. It just goes to show how much he's willing to do to stay in this world. Because if he said to Kirill, I'm not fucking these women, you know, he said it's to show that you're not, you know, a queer quote unquote, but it's also to show that, you know, how do I know you're not a cop? Right. So I think it's important, you know, and again, I, I use yeah, Donnie I don't, Brasco. I don't think that was ever a question in Kirill's mind, whether he was a cop or not. Well, I think maybe not in Kirill's mind, but I think that, so if Viggo Mortensen's character, if um, Nikolai is given like, I guess, carte blanche to do whatever he has to do, but you are going to infiltrate this gang. I think in his head, he's probably like, I'm going to do anything I may, maybe straight up murder would be the point where he'd have to bail himself out. But it reminds me of Donnie Brasco where he eventually, you know, which was a true story too, where he le- led the life for several years. And that's what this guy is trying to accomplish. So does he want to bang uh, probably a 16 year old hooker? No, but he does it because it's going to keep him moving along. But it also shows you the first hint at his true character in this movie. Like he's really out there to help these women right yeah and you do find out that he does kind of save that that one yeah because that girl ends up going back home right yes all right so anyway uh another thing the the chichens i don't feel like they got enough of what they were what they were about why they were opposed to i don't know whatever you call nikolai's uh uh, Semyon's family. They were some sort of opposing rushing mobsters, but I just don't feel that they got enough of an explanation. And they show up kind of out of nowhere. Like that whole scene with the, I don't know what you'd call it, the, where all the people are ushering down the street and people it's are yelling. Match. At it, right? Yeah. They don't specify that that's any kind of sports match. It's just a bunch of people in the street out of nowhere they do they no, do they, no they, they said, don't uh, i he, watched it again he got, over, no over, he got the tickets to, yeah he got to, the tickets to the game he even he got, yeah. he was when was he got the tickets at the beginning when, of the movie but yeah. when they go to that scene you're like what the fuck here's is, how i can't he, understand a single word that's being uttered on the screen here's how you is. know and i get it that you might not know but i could tell you how i know so yes they do show when they go when nikolai and kirill go to see Azim before they cut the body up. The kid comes out and is very excited because he got the tickets. I remember and the ticket scene. So yeah, the yeah. second scene. I didn't make that connection an hour later. Here was the connection. The and it, it, the it worked for me. They're all wearing their scarves. Yep. And that's very much a, a, a European soccer thing. And what they're doing as they're walking down the street is he's yelling out, I think, Arsenal which is a team and they're yelling out their team. And that's essentially a bunch of fucking soccer hooligans. Yep. I figured that out the second time I watched it, but I didn't get it the first time. It just seems so random to me. I think that's just cultural. They could have just shown some sort of little soccer based thing on one of the streets or some kind of came out of the stadium though. No, they were just no tell. The they were just they were in a street. street. Oh, was it? Yeah. Had, like like John said, they had the scarves on. Different yeah, they colors. had scarves on. Yeah, I never questioned. It'd be like if, I just uh, said, the, oh, they're coming know, from the game. Right. It'd be like if the Jets were playing the Giants and you'd walking down the street and be like, you know, go Jets, go Giants, and they have different color scarves. Right. You I, got that. I don't know what Arsenal means. I don't know any of right. what they were right. saying. I was like, yeah. what is going on? I just t- I didn't get it. It just yeah, seems so random to me. Typical soccer in Europe. Yeah, Guys, I think stop talking about sports. This is not a sports. <laughs> I'm just podcast. nitpicking here, but I'm just saying things that took me out of it. Right. right. Things are taking me out of a movie, uh, then it's pissing me off. Right. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, so another one was towards the very end of the movie. They had already hatched their plan about uh, getting the DNA from Semyon since they mm-hmm. already had the baby. Yeah. And then you go into the back of whatever it was, the restaurant, and uh, Kirill is there, and Semyon comes in and he starts pouring alcohol on his you know, uh, where they took a needle and someone's like, what do you do? Oh, I just gave blood. That was kind of ridiculous because they had a warrant. They, they just showed him coming off and getting blood. They, they didn't show any warrant. They didn't show. They, I but feel see, like 
You're thinking too hard on this one. Yeah. You've got to look between. There's there. It's a hour just, and forty minutes. Right. I thought that's. I, so, I, I understand right. all this, but these are all things that just took me out of it. Like he just came in with no explanation, and he had no ending. That was just like it. It just well, that was the last scene he was in. There was but that no, was. I thought that was good storytelling because what that was there was he sees the cops pulling up. They move away from him, and then through exposition, they explain that he gave the blood. Which uh, a warrant? He would probably not have do. given blood. I don't think he would have given blood. I think with a warrant, you would pretty much have to. I don't know. He doesn't seem like the guy who would ain't. just offer up his blood when he knew there was a baby out there. With a warrant, you wouldn't have the option of saying no. I, I'm not he again. Didn't even he didn't even what's his name? Kirill said, "Well, why do they want your blood?" And then he looked up and he's like, "Oh yeah." Then he thought about it. Right. This guy would have known immediately. It wouldn't have been like a thought in his mind. He would have like ran the other way. He wouldn't have gone down there to give blood. He didn't go anywhere. They took it right there. Yeah, right there. When the cops came, they came to his door, said, we have a warrant for your blood. They had a medical technician with them. They drew his blood. He walked back into the into the um, kitchen. Kitchen. No, but they don't have to. That's Manster. You were tired or drunk when you watched that one scene and i i, I he thought didn't that know what was going on they they established that mm-hmm. when when he said why did they take your blood he and i kind of thought that he didn't realize anna like went through the whole diary like i don't because of the events that happened in the movie and he thought that was taken care of i assumed that he thought he was fine on that end because the uncle was supposedly dead and he couldn't translate he did anymore. think the uncle was dead i'll give you that yes right yep that's how so I anyway, his, his ending to me was a little unsatisfying. Deal. I wanted to see some sort of showdown or some, some you kind know, of I, like, something. I, it just ended in that scene. And you didn't I kind that. of agree with you that I wanted to see the look on his face when he actually got taken off the jail. Yep. I wanted some like just facial expression or some finality with his character when it came to him facing his demise, going to jail. But – like John said, I accepted it. Like I was okay yeah. with the actual ending. That could have been shown in the sequel that they uh, they had yeah, planned they, and it fell scrapped. through. Yeah, I'm glad. So By basically, way. all I'm saying is I think maybe there were some cuts or edits. This, this seemed like a slightly abridged version of the real story. Right. And I would have and, liked to see in the real story. And going to your point with the Chechens, I think they would have explored that if it was more of a mob movie. But since it was more about sex trafficking, yeah, I think that's why they didn't really explore that world a little more. The, because I agree with you. I wanted to see a little more of that, but that really wasn't the subject of the movie. You're right. I was glad we didn't see more of that because, number one, the Chechen storyline is one word, revenge. That's it. Mm-hmm. And number yeah. two is one of the things I appreciate about this movie is it's fucking tight. It's an hour, an hour and 40, 40 minutes. minutes. Perfect. Honestly, if I saw the preview in 2007 in the movie theater for Eastern Promises, and I left the movie theater and someone said to me, based on the type of movie that that looks like to be, how long would you say it is? I'd go two and a half hours. Yeah. Right. It looks exactly like right. it should be a two and a half hour long movie. There's a, there's a lot going on. There's uh, multiple characters. There's intrigue. There's a baby. There's a uh, rape. There's prostitution. Blah, blah, blah. It's an hour and 40. It is a tight fucking movie. And I think I'm not saying you're wrong for feeling that way, although you're wrong. I think. <laughs> That things like, <laughs> I think things like the not showing the blood taking scene and not bothering to show the fact that the old man's going to jail adds to that. Like, it's because it's not his story. It's Anna's story. It's Nikolai's Nikolai story. story right. Still yeah. would have liked to have seen something. Because at the end, you get the two bookends that you're looking for. Right. You you're- see... Anna is now the mother of the baby living at home with her uncle who's come back from his exile and her mother, and they seem to be happy. And then you see Nikolai sitting at a table, essentially now almost at the top of the mountain and kind of at a crossroads because what do you, where do you go from there? Right. Right. What can I, you do next? I agree with you because as slow paced as the movie this was, because it was slow paced, uh, it seemed to move pretty quickly for yeah. an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah. Like, like again, for a Cronenberg film, it, it's very different, uh, much like a history of violence. It, it is very slow paced in a slow burn for a Cronenberg film. But it does seem it moves in a quick manner, if that makes sense. It's kind of like an oxymoron. All right. So I think an hour and 45, 
hour and 50 might have worked better for me. We'll add in the never before see uh, the, <laughs> the, the the blood taking scene to make. Oh, no, I don't need happy. the blood taking scene. And we'll add we'll add in them in the in the stadium watching someone do a Pele kick right. into, a, into a net. <laughs> All right, Chris, you've been quiet for a little while. Do you have you lost any, me after the sports? No, do you have ahead. any problems or anything in particular you want to pull out of uh, Eastern Promises? No, I uh, I I agree with you that uh, you know you don't need every little bit to to know what's going on because there, there are certain phrases people give exposition uh, in their way and form. I thought it was uh, really good. And I think it, it benefited being uh, an hour and 40 minutes. I, I, Shane, I understand what you're saying. Uh, yeah. It seemed methodical and yet uh, before I know it was over. Yeah. Right, uh, right. And, and it, it made its points and it showed us a world that uh, you don't see often. Honestly, I would love to see a sequel to this film. I would like to see where Nikolai goes from here. Mm. And apparently there was a sequel in talks, but it just died back in 2010. Right. Yeah. It was planned out. Cronenberg uh, was going to come back. Mortensen was good to go. Um, I think it was going to abandon, you know, Naomi Watts. Her character didn't need to be in this. Right. That, of course. Squashed it. Right. What was it, Lloyd? Focus Films. Oh, okay. They what, went out of business or... They just decided, no, we're not moving forward in 2012. I'm honestly glad because I really enjoy this movie and I'd be worried that you couldn't capture it again. Um, I I would say to anybody, and Shane's brought it up multiple times, if you want to have a really good, like, well, a a little dark, (laughs) but if you want to have a really good double feature night, watch A History of Violence, which was David Cronenberg with Viggo Mortensen, in like 2005 and then followed up with Eastern promises. They are different movies, but they are in the same vein and they have the same star and the same director. They are crime movies that are wildly different, but close enough that I think you would make a, again, kind of depressing, but very cool double feature. Right. But I wanted to see where Nikolai's character goes from here. So I I would have liked to see a sequel. Yeah. You know, with Viggo's performance in this movie going forward into another movie. Yeah, does he become the boss? I assume he Is does. Is that the next step? Yeah, I assume he does. Yeah. You know, because he can play Kareel the way he wants to play him. Right. But I can also see the old man uh, still uh, pulling strings uh, even behind bars. No, nah, I don't see that. I see him no? just going away. I just see him going away in the sequel. And being all Kareel and well, just you know, just in general, Nikolai. no sequel, just behind the scenes. Uh, I, I can totally see him still running that that place, and Kareel is basically the face of the the. Yeah, I see Kareel like taking charge with Nikolai pulling the strings behind Kareel on what to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Kareel needs somebody there. He right. can't do it. He can't do it himself. No. no. And Nikolai hopes for that because that's his way to eventually become Hot Dog. I would like to add, speaking about David Cronenberg and the violence in this movie, you know, and his other movies, I saw when he was talking about Eastern Promises and the violence in this movie and his other movies, and this was interesting to me. He stated that he's an atheist, right? Yeah. So he he, uh, thinks the human body is the first fact of human existence. So murder... Uh, committing murder is an act of absolute destruction, destroying a creature that has never existed before and never will exist again is why he kind of shoots the scenes he shoots when it comes to like the throat slicing and the stabbing and whatever he does. So that's why he likes to show it in, in like whatever, he, you know, the full glory, I guess, if you want to. <laughs> Yeah, right. full glory of murder. Right, of murder. So I just found that very interesting. So he took that, that his, you know... Um, thought process on how he thinks of the human body and that's why he shoots the way he shoots he doesn't shoot it to be gory like kind of like eli roth he just thinks the human body is one of a kind it's never going to exist again and it's like the most criminal thing or most uh, destructive thing you can do to another person is take their life i just found that inter- looking back at this movie well, looking at the throat scene and stuff like that i just found that very interesting well and it makes sense too this is a guy that in his career turned jeff goldblum into a fly well, the- yeah, body horror stuff he did. Yeah, right, body yeah. horror. Dead Ringers, which I saw when I was like 11. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> did not get. And it's about twin gynecologists and there's all these kind of weird It's that's a weird fucking movie. Naked based on a real story. Ugh, is it really? 
I think so. I think I read that once as yeah. that, uh, that it was based on uh, two twin brothers. Another thing before we start rating this that we can't skip out on is the fact that Viggo Mortensen actually hung out <laughs> with real Russian mobsters yeah. to research yes. his role and research his tattoos. I heard he scared people in restaurants. Yes. Wherever <laughs> they were shooting in London. Yep. He went yeah. into a, so they shot, I guess, in a heavily Russian neighborhood, little Russia, maybe. And he went into a restaurant for breakfast in full gear, but with his tattoos out, like his arms and stuff. And apparently he made a lot of the people in the restaurant very nervous because they're Russian nationals living in London and they know what this shit means. They know what it is. Yeah. (laughs) Right. And I guess somebody kind of fed it back to him. And from that point forward, he made it a point that if he went into town or wasn't filming, that he would have none of the tattoos on because yeah. he didn't want to make people feel. Uh, I, I don't know if he's necessarily a method actor, but I could picture him being a pretty intense actor. But I, I think it's a nice story, too, that he's not such a dick that he's going to go in and try to make people feel uncomfortable every day. Oh, my God. Is that Aragon? He looks like a Russian monster. I saw him in Hidalgo. <laughs> yeah. Is that he the had, guy from G.I. Jane? He had a horse. <laughs> All right. So Eastern Promises 2007. Uh, thank you, Shane, for bringing that along. Now is the time on Sprockets when we dance. So what we're going to do now on Pine of Comics do is do the grosses go- and stuff first. Yes, before Ooh. yes, I you I did that last time too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seemed like you were going to the ratings. I was going to the ra- well. Do you want to do the ratings first and then do that? Yeah, I would do the gross. Okay, let's go to the box office for that weekend. All right, so that I, weekend, Eastern Promises came in number twenty-one. Well, I'm going with the first weekend it was released. Yep. Which, I think you said the twenty-first. It was uh, September twenty-first. That, that was the wide yep. release. Okay. It was actually released in fifteen theaters the week before that. And so that's the numbers I got for that. That's fine. Anyway. That's fine. Um, and it did shoot up. So it was 21st on that first week. It was number five on the second week, 547,000. So the top five of that week was uh, Super Bad, number five. Dragon Wars D War. Oh, that's a Korean movie. Oh, I remember that. I never saw it. That's a Korean dragon. I think I remember the King CGI movie. <laughs> wow. 310 to Yuma, number three. Ooh. Mr. Woodcock, number two, and Shut. The Brave One, number one. Mr. Woodcock was not good. It oh, should not be number two like ever. Wait a minute. What is number one? The Brave One with the Jordan brave Foster. One. No, no clue. No clue well, what that is. The top ten of that year are much better. Yeah, give us top ten of uh, right. 2007. Hold, hold on. Hold, hold on. I always do this. I want to guess what number one in 2007 was. By the way, I know every one of these movies. Number one in 2007, 2000. That was not Dark Knight was 2008. Well, I'll, get, I'll work my way up to it. I'll stop. Yeah. Yeah. Stop before one. So number 10, the Simpsons movie. Yep. Number nine, I am legend. Eight, Ratatouille. Seven, 300. Ugh. Six, the born ultimatum. Five, Harry Potter and the order of the Phoenix. Four, Pirates of the Caribbean at world's end. Number three, Transformers. <sighs> all right so what's number two and number one? Oh seven. i'll give you a clue they're yeah, both give me... the third movies of the franchise third movies of the franchise yeah in oh seven so you said pirates of the caribbean oh uh spider-man three is number one yep fuck how was that number one wow. okay and oh seven probably won't figure this one out Superman Returns? No. Green Ogre. Oh, Shrek. Oh, Shrek. Wow. Shrek the Shrek. third. The third. Yeah, that's number two that year. Shane, were you going to say something before? I, I think I saw you jumping in. No, no, I was going to say, like, uh, Lloyd hit it perfectly. Um, but after the following week, they did, uh, Eastern Promises did finish number uh, five, but it yep. stayed in the top ten three weeks after that. So it was like number five, number eight, number nine, and number ten. Oh, wow. So okay. it really did a good jump up from it had a good opening. It's really, because yeah, just didn't last long. Right, right, right. It ended up uh, grossing 17 million uh, domestic, 56 worldwide. It had a budget of 50 million dollars, so it you know yep. it made its money back. Really, 50 oh, yeah. million? 50. Yeah, 50 million. It doesn't it, look it. 
Did any of you guys understand what the title meant? No. At first? No. Or did Honestly, you no. Or? Nope, I did not. It's basically just the promise of, of girls having a better life. It's an Eastern promise. Oh, okay. Okay. So All girls right. from the East moving to the West. And so in that, London, Russia is the East. You know, right. we don't really think of that uh, so much. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. I didn't look that up. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You know, the other day I did think about that quickly. I didn't look it up. I'm like, what does this fucking title mean? And that actually cements the idea that Shane said that this movie is more about the sex trafficking, you know, uh, idea, the plot. All right. So let's start with the Frodel zero to five quarter scale. What do you give 2007's Viggo Mortensen starring Eastern Promises? I will say, like, I, I, Shane, you know this. I'm terrible at these. I'm terrible at giving scores. But I will have to say uh, three and a half. Edit, edit him out of here. Edit that out. <laughs> what? No, edit it out. <laughs> I've been Two, given an 2. order. 2.5. What, what do we, what, where, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? I think if you half. say, I think if you say 2.5, I've got to take you out of the whole show and I'm not yeah, doing yeah, that much you're, editing. You're, yeah, you're <laughs> All right, who's next? All right. I will go to the Manster for what could be a surprise from his attitude earlier. Either way. Well, just keep in mind. I, I like the movie. Yep. The first time I saw it, when I had all these little nitpicky items and I didn't understand half of what they were saying and what was going on, it was a two and a half. The second time I saw it, I understood what was going on a lot more in three and a half. Three and a half. Okay. All whoa, right. Whoa, well, whoa, whoa, Hold on. He can give a three and a half. No one says anything. I say three and a half. I put my head down. I'm ashamed. He, I'm ashamed. Three and a half. He, Come on. I can't give a five. First of all, look. So really, it's three and a half out of four. Shane, out of five? You, got, you can give five. a five. I'm not going to give a five. I'm not giving a five. You're never going to give a five. No. I'll tell you right now, nobody's picked a five, but there's movies I would give a five to. Absolutely. Yeah. Jaws. Well, we haven't done Jaws yet. Someone does Jaws. I'm going to break the scale. <laughs> yeah, that's. I'm going to give it a five fucking thousand. <laughs> <laughs> All right. By the way, I got two of those new Jaws uh, Blu-rays coming out, 4Ks. Yeah, you know, I didn't I order. I didn't order that before two weeks ago. I forgot yeah. about it. They sold out. So yep. today, Amazon. Yeah, Amazon showed them back and. Two weeks ago, before they came out, it was twenty four bucks. Uh, it came back today, thirty five. I bought it though because I, I don't want nineteen ninety nine. From where? I think it was Best Buy online. Fuck. See, yeah. this is why I should pay more attention. All right, let's get back to Eastern Promises. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I give this. God, I don't want to offend Shane. I'm higher than these guys on this. I'm not hitting four, but I'm at a three point seven five. All right. I really enjoy this movie. I hate this portion of our show because I feel like we have to give it something to qualify and to kind of, but I also want to say to the listeners that these can change over time. I could think harder about it and go, you know, maybe four, four and a half. This is a three, seven, five. Shane, where are you going with this? And you're obviously I'm going higher than all you schmucks. Yeah. I'm going going 4.25. Okay. Based on just the overall acting from Vigo, from uh, Naomi Watts, from Simeon, uh, Chris Hill, all the character development between all those people and the overall story, I did not mind the ending not seeing Simeon go to jail, though I, I agreed with Lloyd. I, I, I would have enjoyed that, but I didn't need it. I got where the movie was going. So I just really loved the character development between all these characters and where the stories kind of interlooped and interceded. So I, it was very well shot. I like everything about this movie. I give it a 4.25 out of five for me. Okay. I highly recommend this movie. I, I always like Lloyd said, he'll never give a five. I'm always very cautious when I hit fours or fives. Like it, cause, cause then I think, well, I did a, like, one of our first episodes we did the thing and i think i gave the thing a four and that's easily almost a five. Oh, right? absolutely what are you doing no i, I know i gave that a four and a half <laughs> i know and i i look back on that and i sometimes think i should think harder about this beforehand so right now i'm at 3.75 this is a very good movie uh shane thanks for bringing it now 
uh, before we end the show. Chris, do you want to give anything out there for arguing with myself where people could find you, talk about anything in particular? I tell you, I'm, uh, I'm slacking. I'm slacking. Due to the, uh, the COVID not having it, but uh, being in it like everyone else, uh, man, to find the time to do what I love. Uh, I love doing this. I'd love to do it more. Arguing with myself. Type it in to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'm on all the, the social meeds. Um, or just type in Mr. Marvel. You'll find nah, that, that only uh, comes in your search engine. So, yeah, uh, arguing with myself, movie reviews. Uh, I got to get back, back into it. But, yeah, arguing with myself is my uh, title and uh, uh, hanging out with these lovely guys. Yeah, that's yeah. that's all of us here. All right, well, Pine of Comics, you're listening to us. You know where to find us. You can hear us on Sunday nights, the radio show, WESUFM.org, 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m., Weekly episodes of the podcast usually come out uh, weekly. I don't have a date. All these podcasts have a date. Fuck that. I don't have a right. date. No date. No date. No just, idea when this is coming Just out. hang in and you'll get the show every Four week. One week. Yeah, every <laughs> week. Hey, I did two a couple weeks ago. Every yeah, week you did. We, uh, we have a show. But our, we don't matter right now. The man of the hour is Shane, our buddy Shane. Thank yeah. you so much for coming on and talk all about your show again and where people could find you. Well, thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. You can find me on the Apple Podcast or Media Mosh. Go check me out on the Facebook page, uh, Media Mosh, and the Twitterverse, at Shane Media Mosh. And I have all your Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, and hopefully, hopefully, in July, your theatrical releases. Are you, let's not get too far into this, but are you going to jump back into the theaters? Absolutely. I'm <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah. I've been with my kids since March. I will okay. put my mask on. I will wear a helmet if they ask me to. I am going to the movies in fucking July. Period. End of the discussion. I'm there. I'm there. All right. We're going to leave it at that. If you need to find us, you can find us here at Pine of Comics. Find Chris to argue with myself and find Shane at the fucking movies. <laughs> Lloyd, do it. See ya. See ya. It's over, Johnny. It's over. Nothing is over. Nothing. You just don't turn it off!